What's going on guys? And if you're watching this video, it's because you are the first generation millionaire or you have intentions on being the first generation millionaire in your family. And what I'm gonna do is break down just a couple of key concepts that you wanna be considering on your way to positioning your finances to be a millionaire. Not make a million dollars. Let me be clear, a net worth millionaire. Now, the first thing in the first type of philosophy you want to take on is the CEO mentality of your finances. Now, being the CEO is not easy. You've got to make tough decisions. You've got to be decisive. And every decision you make isn't going to be the right decision. But you've got to make the decision. That being said, with you on your path to becoming a first generation millionaire, you want to take on that mindset that you are the financial CEO. Also, and if you don't have the desire to be the financial CEO, find somebody who can help you be a financial CEO, but for all pretense purposes, you want to be the financial CEO. Now, on the way to becoming a millionaire, the first thing that you absolutely, unequivocally have to have a handle on is cash flow. Your bank account balance, your brokerage account balance, but more so, we'll just say your bank account balance, saving account balance, and retirement account balance are zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven digit numbers that reflect your financial behavior. So we have to have a strong handle on cash flow. But then what we have to do is once we have a really good handle on our cash, we want to make sure our credit is positioned in a way so if we need to leverage and deploy somebody else's money, we can do so and we have the sufficient cash flow to pay back that particular debt or whatever the case is because you can leverage debt to build wealth. Now, the second component of this is taxes. Okay, cool, you made some money, awesome. It's not about how much money you make, it's about how much money you keep. And I've said this multiple times, but the other key to really, really getting to the point of millionaire status and or being able to like build wealth is reducing tax as much as possible. Now, once you understand these, these foundational keys, there's three ways you're gonna do this. And you could do a combination of all three. Way number one is gonna be just through real estate, right? Purchasing a hard asset that's generally gonna be able to appreciate with time. And there's so many different ways to do real estate investing. This particular video isn't about real estate investing, it's just letting you know that that should be a part of your portfolio for a number of reasons, especially when it comes to credit. The second way you're gonna be able to do this is just straight up in the stock market. There's so many different ways to invest in the stock market with different ways to do it, whether it's Forex, whether it's cryptocurrency, whether it's day trading, whether it's buy and hold, whether it's IPOs, whether it's just retirement accounts. The combination of all those things, active investing, passive investing, there's so many different ways you do it. The point I'm making is being able to know strategically where you fit in that particular part of it, even if it's as simple as you putting money towards a retirement account on an annual basis, that in itself can make you a millionaire. Case in point, one of the trainings that I've done previously is how much people unnecessarily pay between interest going to the bank with a car and a home. So if you look at overpaying an interest for a 30 year mortgage, you know, plus overpaying an interest for a car loan, that amount of money over the course of 30 years could be about $165,000, just an in interest you're paying with just one home and one car. But let me be clear with the home. Many people try to get themselves in a place where they just get just barely, barely, barely approved score, like a 620. So their interest rate is higher than what it needs to be. So the interest rate may be like six or seven percent, and you're like, well, six or seven percent is not that high, but over the course of 30 years, it ends up being like $150,000. You couple that with bad credit with just a, a, a re unreasonable interest rate, that's $164,000. So when you look at that and you divide it, what could that money have done had you not paid it in interest and you invested in your retirement account, right? What would that money turn into? Then you, then you, if I were to put it in the S&P 500, just to finish this point, the S&P 500 is a stock index, and over the last 30 years, of the, as of the recording of this video, it has averaged a 12% rate of return, meaning that's how much interest that money was making. Now, one other rant of a rant, and inside of a tangent to make this clear, 
there's something called the rule of 72. All this really means is you take whatever interest rate you're getting, you divide it by 72, that's how many years it takes your money to double. Keep it extremely simple. Instead of you paying that money to the banks, if you were putting your money in a retirement account on an annual basis and you were getting a 12% rate of return, this means that your money would double every six years because I believe 12 goes into 72 six times. So just that little piece of knowledge alone what on your way to becoming a millionaire is important. So just simply having good credit and redirecting towards a retirement account that just passively invests, because that's one of the ways that you invest in a retirement account or stock market is passive investing, letting a, a, uh, a, a, a index or so to speak do the, the picks for you or whatever, that's, that's way to millions. But then you have active investing. And there's so many different ways of active investing. It's ridiculous. I won't make this point about it or get into the weeds. But what you want to understand is you've got your real estate portfolio, you've got your stock portfolio, whether it's stocks, bonds, mutual funds, crypto, doesn't matter. That's a part of your portfolio, right? Again, the biggest key to this, cash flow management, reduce the amount of money we're going to pay in tax, right? Because it's almost like one of those things where, hey, look, I'd rather that money come to my household versus it go to the IRS. And I'd rather be able to defer tax as much as possible if I own real estate. Now the third and my most favorite way of the other two, the other two is just what we, what we um, are gonna be doing to build up our net worth, but the third way is good old fashioned entrepreneurship, starting a business, a cash flow producing business. Now there's a difference, to be clear, there is a difference between having a business that operates without you and having a high income that you are responsible for generating it. And there's nothing wrong with it, but I want you to understand what I'm saying is being able to take a system, a process, and turn it into a cash flow producing business. So at the end, and this is why I'm trying to make a distinction between having something that's just a high income, which is nothing wrong, or having something, because when you have a high income, you're the one responsible for producing that income. But if you don't do the necessary activities, Although you are a self-employed business person, you technically don't have a business, you just have a self-employed high income skill set. Huge difference there. Versus with a business, is setting a system in place that's gonna produce a predictable result, giving a customer a great product or service, so that way you can have predictable revenue and be able to scale. And when we say scale, if your business is making 100,000, take it to a million, a million to 10 million and so on and so forth. So at the end, you can do a couple of things. Number one, get bought out by somebody else. So if your business is producing a certain amount of cash flow, a certain amount of revenue, and you got into the weeds of making that your number one investment, then you can sell that business for millions of dollars. It just really depends on the recurring revenue and if you're able to do that, but that's that third way, right? But even if you don't want to get into the weeds of setting your business up to sell, well, what do you do to produce enough cash flow that's over and above your expenses so that, hey, look, I don't want to do all that business stuff. I just want to have a high income. Cool, you can have a high income. You want to take a portion of your high income, and if you don't want to invest in other businesses, you can invest in the stock market that's investing in other businesses, and then you can invest in real estate, which is going to build up your net worth, and then boom, you're a millionaire, right? But that's the key. Now, as we wrap up here, you want to make sure, number one, you have good handle on your cash flow. It's not much how much money you make, it's how much money you keep. You buy hard assets that are going to appreciate with time, conservative. You get involved in some capacity in the stock market, even if it's just a retirement account. Number three, you have a high income or you create a business. Best case scenario, you can sell your business for three to six times multiple, whatever your recurring revenue is. So um, I won't get into EBITDA and all of this stuff, but just to be very, very simple, if your business is producing $3 million a year in recurring revenue, which means the business is gonna produce that money whether you work or not, you typically can sell or have a buyer who would buy that for three to, it depends on the business and the buyer, 10 times that revenue. Three on the low end is three, 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 nine million. 10 times on the high end is 30 million, meaning you will get a check for $30 million. I don't know about you, 
But if I had a business that I sold for $30 million, I'd be pretty happy because I would just do the same exact thing and reinvest back in another business. But that's how you really, 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 really want to build wealth. Now, the last thing is making sure you have the proper protection in place. It is so, so important to ensure as a financial CEO and you're navigating these, to these transactions that you have a really good tax planner. You have a really good attorney. You have a really good advisor. You have a really good investment person, right? You have somebody as you're, because you're the CEO, you have someone that not just is trying to sell you, but they've demonstrated through their track record of believable results with clients prior to you working with them that they know what they're talking about. And more than likely, that person has the results that they're recommending in their own actual life. It's so important that you do that when you're becoming the CEO. Don't listen to the blind saying, oh yeah, I did, you know, it kind of, it's, it's um, I, I respect it because on one front, you know, we have these individuals who may have paid down their debt or may have had a quick little thing and now they're all of a sudden trying to help other people doing it, but their scope is limited because they're the story. The true test is how many other people have they helped. So when you're hiring that financial person in your business or your board, so to speak, as the financial CEO, that they have a track record. You have a strong insurance advisor that understands the proper amounts of life insurance, disability insurance, health insurance, a good property and casualty advisor who's going to make sure that you have the proper homeowner's insurance, great deductibles, proper amount of coverages so when life happens, because life is going to happen to all of us, whether we want it to happen or not, we have the proper insurance in place. We have, a, uh, we have an umbrella policy, worst case scenario. Then we start making sure with the attorney, we have the proper legal entities in place. And not, not to uh, say last but not least, we have the proper estate plan. So should something happen to us, this millions, whether we're millionaire, one digit, or hundreds of millions before we become billionaires, we have our wealth protected to where we avoid the biggest thing of them all, which is a state tax. <laughs> Remember, I said this at the beginning of this, taxes is the biggest part of this. So we wanna make sure that we have the proper amount of, we have the proper estate plan in place. We have the proper will in place. We, do we have a revocable trust? Do we have an irrevocable trust? Heck, what the heck's the difference? What, heck, what is a trust? What are you talking about, Kenny? Well, all of this is important to your way to wealth because the last thing you want to do is work so hard doing all the stuff I just talked about before this, and then you die and it gets taxed at 50% because of a state tax. You gotta be kidding me. All of that work, I'm gonna be taxed at 50% because I didn't have an estate plan? You're absolutely, you're absolutely, it's the American way. Again, it's a tax evasion versus tax avoidance and making sure that you have all of this stuff set up in some type of structure, not a will, a will makes your wishes clear, a trust. And to be very, very clear, understanding the difference between a revo revocable, irrevocable trust, a, uh, yeah, a revocable and non-revocable trust to keep this extremely simple and then making sure you have that part buttoned up too. So you're a fortress. And then the last thing here is you did all of this work to build all of this wealth. You're a millionaire. Everything's taken care of. You're the financial CEO. You've got competent people in place now. Who do we leave this to and how do we groom those individuals to understand that just because this foundation has been put in place don't mean it's free money, right? Because again, many people don't come from trust fund money. You're going to be the one who has a trust fund money for the generations after you, but you got to groom them now so they know exactly how to manage that stuff and they have a different perspective about money. And case in point, just because your family got money don't mean that your kids and your kids' kids deserve that money. You want to put certain metrics and principles in place so that way they understand work ethic, they understand principles, they're just not given stuff, right? They have to earn it so that way they can appreciate it and you've got to educate them on how to continue it. But that's it, guys. So that's all I have. But that is the way, high level, you want to be considering becoming the first generation millionaire or you're already a millionaire, how to protect the wealth and continue to make it grow for you.